Joining us now is Professor Lawrence Tribe, who has taught constitutional law at Harvard Law School for five decades. His new Boston Globe op-ed is titled, In Defense of Maine, Secretary of State Shanna Bellow's Courageous Decision to Keep Trump Off the Ballot. Professor Tribe, I read your Globe op-ed piece. I, I want to go to the new information we have tonight uh, in, in Donald Trump's legal filing in Maine. Uh, point one is he did not engage in insurrection. Uh, those words are, in quotation marks, engage and insurrection, leaning heavily on whatever the legal definition of engage and insurrection turns out to be in this case. And that's exactly what we would expect him to say, that there's nothing new about that. Shana Bellows held a hearing in which she considered all of the legal materials relevant and all of the factual evidence, including the evidence developed at the January 6 uh, congressional hearings in which Donald Trump was invited to appear, he was given ample opportunity to present his side of the narrative um, in this administrative hearing. He didn't succeed. Um, his claim that he was denied fair process is based on nothing in the law. He's absolutely confusing an administrative hearing of the kind that Shana Bellows properly held under the law of the state of Maine with a criminal trial or with a civil trial in which damages might be assessed or the property or liberty of the of defendant might be at stake. Here, what is at stake is whether Donald Trump disqualified himself. Unlike many other possible disqualifications, like age or birth in the United States, where there's nothing an individual can do to remove the disqualification, it's just there because of a fact that's beyond that person's control. Here, it's entirely within the control of an officer of the United States who takes an oath to support the Constitution not to engage in insurrection against it. If he chooses to engage in insurrection, there's nothing undemocratic or unfair about saying he's disqualified himself. The 34-page opinion by Secretary Bellows is very precise. She invokes the right statutes under the law of Maine, and there's nothing in what the president's new lawyer just filed that in any way gives the courts of Maine a basis to overturn what she did. But she was right in suspending the effect of her decision pending an appeal to the Superior Court of Maine, recognizing that she doesn't have unilateral authority to make this decision. Uh, Donald Trump's uh, new Maine lawyer is uh, leaning on the statutes uh, in Maine, saying that those statutes only give the Secretary of State authority to do things like uh, make sure he has enough signatures to be on the ballot, requires thousands of signatures, make sure his address is correct, uh, kind of clerical things like that in his application to be on the ballot. And then uh, the Trump lawyer says the Secretary had no statutory authority to consider the challenges raised under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Well, they're tr basically trying to treat the disqualification clause of Section 3, which is really central to the preservation of democracy from those who would overturn it, as a kind of second-class status, not nearly as basic as residency or, or birth. It isn't. It's equally important. It's perhaps the most important qualification. And there's nothing in the law, either state or federal, that draws a distinction between bases of disqualification that are rather simple to apply, like age, and those that are more complicated to apply, like whether you're an insurrectionist. There's no principled basis for treating them differently unless we say that hard questions are not to be 
put by the Constitution of the United States uh, to public officials. What it all comes down to, all of these arguments, both here and in Colorado, are not really arguments about Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and why conservatives and liberals alike have concluded that it applies here. They're basically arguments against the Constitution. They're arguments that say the Constitution of the United States made a big mistake in telling officials of the United States, especially a president, that if they take an oath to support the Constitution and then turn against it and engage in treachery against the Constitution, insurrection against it, then they can't run again. That that provision just shouldn't have been there because it's not a good idea. If somebody is popular enough to potentially win, then they really ought to be able to run even if they're disqualified. But there's no basis for that. It's like saying, it's like somebody saying, I don't like the Second Amendment. Second Amendment means a lot of people die who shouldn't die, so I'm going to disregard it. You can't just take part of the Constitution and say you don't want to take it seriously. Either the Constitution is the law of the land, and it's the only fundamental law we've got, or it isn't. And in a year like this, when the future of democracy around the world and the future of the rule of law is basically up for grabs to take that position. And certainly Donald Trump takes it when he says he's absolutely immune from prosecution for anything that he does as president, like even if he took a bribe uh, in order to veto a bill, because that's his job, he can't be prosecuted. That is a formula for ripping our democracy apart. That's what's at stake in this new year 2024, and we have to recognize that that is the issue before us. In this appeal in Maine, and in the appeal he's filing from Colorado, and in the claim of being above the law that he is making when he claims immunity. In fact, in those immunity cases, he makes the remarkable argument that he's more like a king than than he is um, than he is an officer of the United States. Some of his defenders say he's not an officer under the United States. He is the government of the United States. L'état et moi, I am the state. Mm -hmm. That is not the way a government works that most of us would feel safe living in.